Hello and good evening. Um, I'd like to call to order the October 5th, 2023 New Hanover County Planning Board meeting. My name is Jeff Petroff. Um, I ask that you all please turn off or silence your mobile devices. Please sign in if you plan to speak tonight. Um, these meetings are closed captioned for public broadcast, so please speak clearly into the microphone when you come to the podium. Um, at this time, I would like to ask everyone who's able to please stand and ask um, Mr. Vafer to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. The items from tonight's meeting will go forward to the county commissioner's meeting scheduled for Monday, November 6, 2023. That meeting will begin at approximately 4 p.m. and will be held here in the New Hanover County Historic Courthouse. The planning board representative for this meeting is Mr. Clark Hipp. Are you able to attend? Yes. Thank you. So the format for tonight's meeting um, the public hearing is each side has a total of 20 minutes, 15 minutes for presentation, and then 15 minutes for rebuttal. As a reminder, this board is only an advisory board. The Board of Commissioners makes the final decision on any request being considered tonight, but public comment tonight can impact our recommendation and what may be ultimately presented to the commissioners. This time I'd like to read the Code of Ethics. In accordance with the New Hanover County Board of Commissioners resolution adopting a Code of Ethics, as adopted on January 4th, 2016, is the duty of all county boards and committees to respect and abide by the New Hanover County Co Code of Ethics in the performance of their duties. More specifically, all planning board members should obey all applicable laws, uphold the integrity and independence of the board, avoid impropriety, faithfully perform the duties of the office, and conduct the affairs of the board in an open and public manner, it is further the duty of every board member to avoid conflicts of interest as defined in North Carolina General Statute, Chapter 160D, Section 109. Does any member have any known conflict of interest with respect to any matters coming before the board this evening? If so, please identify the conflict and refrain from any undue participation in the particular matter involved. At this time, I'd like to move to our regular agenda items. Um, first item is Z23-18, as a request by Cindy Wolf with Design Solutions, the applicant, to rezone approximately 1.63 acres zoned R15 residential located at 6218 Carolina Beach Road to CZD B2 Highway Commercial for the uses of office and warehousing. As a reminder, this is a public hearing. We will hear a presentation from staff, then the applicant and any opponents um, will each be allowed 15 minutes for their presentation and an additional five minutes for rebuttal. This time I'd like staff um, to make their presentation. Mr. Biddle. Thank you, Chair, members of the board. This application is a request to rezone approximately 1.63 acres from the R15 residential district to a conditional B2 regional business district for a maximum 4,450 square foot office and warehousing facility with associated moving truck rental. Located at 6218 Carolina Beach Road, the site has been zoned R15 since 1971. At that time, the purpose of the district was to ensure that housing served by private septic and wells would be developed at low densities. Since then, the Carolina Beach Road Corridor has experienced a transition to higher density residential and mixed commercial districts. As we can see, the subject parcel is situated in an area with multiple zoning districts in the vicinity. The parcel directly north and along Carolina Beach Road is zoned B2. The parcels northeast are zoned R15, while directly east is a conditionally zoned B1 district. Immediately south and west is the conditionally zoned R10 district Sellers Cove. As is seen in the aerial photo, the property is located along the Carolina Beach Road corridor and north of the private access way Condo Club Drive. 
Here's the same aerial photo with images of uh, the property from different angles. The image to the left was taken along Carolina Beach Road, whereas the image to the right was taken along uh, Condo Club Drive. Here are examples of single family residences you might see in the R15 district. The image to the right portrays an example of a single family residence found along a major corridor. Here's an image representing a development of uh, a portable container storage site with a B2, within a B2 district. This U-Haul truck and U-Box rental agency is located right off of Market Street. The B2 district was established to provide for the proper site layout and development of larger formats or larger structure size business uses, including big box stores and automobile dealers. It should also be noted that the B2 district is designed to provide for the appropriate location and design of auto-oriented uses that meet the needs of the motoring public or that rely on pass-by traffic. As illustrated by the applicant's concept plan, the proposed development is directly located off of Carolina Beach Road. On site, there is an existing single family residence that prior to development will be removed. Along with the residence are two accessory structures that will remain a part of the proposed developments. They will serve as a uh, rental office for moving trucks rental and as a supply storage space. The applicant will be adding a 3,200 square foot warehouse to store the associated store, uh, storage containers. Each container is designed to provide temporary storage and can be transported from site to a customer's location and then returned. The concept plan also depicts multiple parking spaces to accommodate employees, customers, and moving trucks. Excuse me. The site is currently served by a septic and well. And here we can see that the applicant has proposed a stormwater pond. Encompassing the site is a combination of easements and buffer yards. Along the north property line is a 10-foot utility easement, while separating the southern property line from Condo Club Drive is a 20-foot vegetative buffer yard. Along the corridor, the applicant has conditioned a 20-foot wide access easement this easement is expected to be a, uh, provide a uh, future pedestrian and bike pathway. It should be noted that when adjacent to residential lots, additional use standards are enforced. In this case, a minimum of a 30 foot interior side and a 35 foot rear setback will be required between the proposed development and the Southern Cove community. While the interior setback consists of a 20-foot vegetative buffer yard, the applicant has conditioned that the 35-foot rear setback will be an enhanced type A opaque buffer consisting of three rows of evergreen shrubbery and an additional two rows of staggered evergreen trees that are anticipated to grow between 15 and 20 feet tall. A single driveway will provide access to the site. Entering and exiting will consist of a right hand in and a right hand out. Within 800 feet, there are two points for travelers to make a U-turn along the corridor. Where Cathay Road meets Carolina Beach Road, there is a traffic light. And it should be noted that Condo Club Drive is a private access way for the residents of Sellers Cove. Nearby, there is one approved subdivision under development and one state transportation improvement program, the details of which are in the staff report. If developed within the site's current zoning district, a maximum density of four single-family dwelling units would be permissible, generating approximately 3 a.m. and 4 p.m. peak hour trips. The proposed conditional rezoning to B2 is for the development of a mini warehouse, small office building, with an estimated 1 a.m. and 1 p.m. peak hour trips generated. The proposed rezoning's estimated traffic generation is under the 100 peak hour threshold and therefore does not trigger the UDO's requirement for a traffic impact analysis. Prior to any development, the project will be subject to NCDOT's driveway permitting standards. Due to the site's size and proximity to the Carolina Beach Road corridor, the parcel is less likely to be developed residentially. Nearby commercial development includes a restaurant, grocery store, and other community level service uses. The comprehensive plan designates this property as being part of the community mixed use place type. 
This place type includes commercial uses and encourages infield developments along the highway corridors. In addition to serving as a transition between the highway and neighboring residential uses, the proposed project will provide a use that could be appropriate in nodes as well as transitional areas while providing service to nearby residents. The proposed conditions are a combination of applicant and staff-led considerations towards development. They include limiting the proposed land use, providing a public access easement along a major corridor, excluding commercial RV and boat storage, prohibiting outdoor storage of storage containers on site, height restrictions on all structures, general considerations towards exterior lighting, and providing an enhanced type A opaque rear buffer yard. Should the rezoning be approved, development of the site will be subject to additional development review to ensure all land use regulations are met. This concludes my presentation. I am available to answer any questions concerning this presentation and or the staff reports. Mr. Jamar Johnson of the WMPO and Mr. Galen Jamison of County Engineering are here to answer any questions within their expertise. The applicant has prepared a presentation and will be able to answer more in-depth questions relating to the proposed site developments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riddle. Any, um, any board questions for staff at this time? <coughs> Mr. Moore. Mr. Biddle, um, yes. is the site going to be solely for the U-Haul rental business? Because I know that typically the way these businesses operate, they can be in conjunction to with another business. So the site is going to be for a storage, storage. containing warehouse for, uh, I don't want to use the term pods or U-boxes right. because those are trademarked, but containers that people can move to site, put their stuff in, and then relocate to the warehouse. Okay. And it's also going to facilitate moving truck rentals. Okay, so it has dual uses there. I yes, sir. Right. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. At this time, I'd like to open the meeting up to the applicant and supporters. Miss um, Wolf, and you've got, I think, two other, your property owner and your developer. They'll just be available for questions, generally speaking. Good evening. My name's Cindy Wolf. Um, I am here on behalf of the owner, Shirley Norris, and her son, Michael Norris, and power of attorney is, is also here in the event that he would need, be needed for a question. But overall, uh, Carolina Beach Road, as Wendell pointed out, is lined with businesses, old and new, and higher densities of residential development being requested monthly. The properties on our north are already zoned for B2 and can develop by right with any of the uses in that district. The subject parcel is owned by Shelley, I'm sorry, Shirley Sellers Norris. It was subdivided back in 2003 to create the track to the rear that became Sellers Cove. That fact is that the common, that condominium project was one of my designs back in 2006. I stood there here in front of the pass board and argued its consistency and appropriateness for entitlement. And as you can imagine, there was opposition by surrounding neighborhoods at that time to the 99 units and the three-story buildings. I'm proud of the community that resulted and it's attractive. It has proud residents, that's obvious. Ms. Norris continued to live here and her tract is currently occupied by the home she's in and several accessory buildings. Because of the adjacency of the single family home to the multifamily use, even though it was her development basically, Sellers Cove was required to provide a buffer yard along their entry road. That was accomplished with a three to four foot high earthen berm and evergreen screening vegetation to provide visual opacity higher than the standard six foot. You can see along the entry road that the existing vegetation has certainly accomplished that. Now, the proposed use, which is a moving vehicle and equipment rental business. With that said, there has been some issue taken over the title on the plan being U-Haul. For that, I apologize. There are so many times now with a variety of vendors for almost every business, and some descriptions have just become synonymous with particular uses. We overtly say Kleenex for tissue, Xerox for copier. In my mind, U-Haul is pretty much the gold standard for moving rentals, but this project has no current association with U-Haul. I labeled it that in hopes of making sure that people understood the use that we were pursuing. 
My point was to provide that description, and there are several well-known companies whose service would be the criteria for this proposed business. They include Penske, Enterprise, Budget, Hertz. They aren't just car rental companies, some of them. They all rent trucks, trailers, and now several have evolved into temporary box storage. The existing house, as Wendell pointed out, will be demolished. The accessory buildings will be renovated and adapted for use as the business office and storage of moving materials. As a future phase of the project, we also included the warehouse for the pods as an accessory use. It is not a self-storage facility. It is not technically warehousing as far as bringing large-scale trucks in and out of here. There is no public access to it. These boxes are delivered to a home of a renter. They fill it. They call for pickup, which is handled by an employee of this company on a flatbed truck with rollers. The employee drives it back to the facility, offloads it onto a scissors dolly, and deposits it in the building for a contracted period of time. It's not big forklifts, it's not a lot of noise, it's not large trucks. The employee, I'm sorry, eventually the pod is then re-delivered by an employee back to the same location or a designated relocation. It's an extremely low generator of traffic as far as that goes. The entry drive will be permitted by NCDOT with whatever safety improvements they deem necessary, but the intersection of our driveway to the road is already 80 feet beyond the taper of the turn lane. It is fully in the turn lane. Um, there are only a handful of employees at this place at any one time. Customers are throughout the day, but not a whole lot, as you can well imagine, with this type of business. They either come for pickup or drop off, but also for the purchase of packing materials. It is a normal business hours type of use on only Monday through Saturday. Customers arrive to pick up their vehicle during those hours. Employees of the business put those vehicles in the pickup and drop off. You don't have employees driving around the interior of the site. I'd imagine that sometimes there could be an after-hours drop-off, but those spaces are at the far front. You drop the keys into the office slot and you take your lift home. Again, very low impact. The field survey I exhibited earlier shows that the site drains um, away from the rear and basically to where I show the pond. Um, a stormwater pond will be installed to address water quality and detention, as are the regular requirements of any plan and new development that we occurs. There seems to be a variety of opinions as to the op opposition to the proposal, but in my mind, the foremost and the one that is valid is visual screening and separation of uses. As a conditional district, mitigation of impact is the means to address that. With the adjacent condominium building being three-story to the full permitted height at that time of 35 feet, we obviously can't totally screen all views all over the tract, but this property is going to become something most probably business. So I pointed out previously that they had a buffer requirement um, between their buildings and Mrs. Norris just because she was still a resident. And that too has met its purpose. It is bermed up and it is heavily planted. This is all beside the building, their buffer yard. As for our part, we have created a plan that does not make any use of the full 35 foot rear setback. The normal buffer would only be 17 and a half feet. We have also offered a condition to enhance that simple required six foot high type A buffer to provide not only wider separation but also a varied screening of up to 20 feet in height with fast growing evergreen plantings. Any activity at the rear building is all oriented towards the front and will in itself provide shielding of labor and or the lighting. Most lighting will be wall mounted, but we have committed that any poles that we might use around the site would be limited in height. With that being said, we do believe that the comprehensive plan designates the area as community mixed use. It looks for these types of services that are near to the um, users that would use it. The proposal improves the form and function of an underutilized site, certainly maximizes desired land use efficiency, and it is an excellent opportunity for good economic development and increased tax base. I'm here to answer your questions. Uh, we hope you will agree that this, with the staff that this is consistent and is a reasonable business for this corridor along Carolina Beach Road. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Wolf. Um, questions from Mr. Mr. Chair, Hitt. I have a question. Thank yeah. you, Ms. Wolf. Um, I don't see on your plan anything related to trash or dumpster. Has that been considered? It has not, but it would be up near the rental office and supplies. There'd be no reason to put it to the rear. That's who would be using the dumpster. In a case like this, there generally is not a lot of trash involved. People have to clean out their trucks before they, you know, give them back. And um, That's interesting because yeah. I thought there would be a, a potentially heavy I mean, need. there, I, no doubt, there will probably be a dumpster. And I can easily commit to having it up there beside the supply storage. Yeah, that, That's the I think logical because location. I, I agree. The use seems to be um, low uh, impact from a noise standpoint. Uh, but I could see a, tr uh, a, a dumpster, a dump truck coming in once a week or once every other, uh, twice a week, uh, creating a s noise at an inappropriate time. So that that would be something that I would ask. Uh, this board to consider it as a condition that it be um, located uh, reasonably close to the rental office. Right? Something of that. Not nature. a problem with that. Thank you. All right. Yes, Mr. Avery. I have multiple questions for you, Cindy. Um, <clears throat> you said earlier that the this would be normal operations Monday through Saturday. Um, what are the hours of operation? Eight to five? Eight to ten? I, we generally don't want to specify exact hours, but normal office hours are generally six to eight for the extended business hours. Now, that being said, you know, a, a business like this is generally eight to five, in my experience. Also, the site plan doesn't show any security fencing. Is there any fencing plan for this? To, for I would imagine, yes. You would imagine, but you don't know? That's generally not some. I mean, it would not be screening fencing, but yes, no, there would be security, security purposes. Fencing. I mean, they, they have a storage facility there. Most of those mm -hmm. facilities have. That's a know. locked warehouse. I but yes, that. I would say yes, there would be security fencing. And no, I have not specifically located it. And you guys, you guys are going to be uh, using water well and septics. Have you approached the health department and had any kind of inquiries with them about suitability of that for this property? That will be part of the TRC review. We're eliminating the house, so we're eliminating several fixtures. There is an exist existing septic system that would have to be recertified for the use of a unisex bathroom in the office. And lastly, and there uh, is actually sewer available. We're just not firm on needing to actually to tie into it if it's just for that one unisex bathroom. I know it's at an early stage, but have you had any conversations with DOT about the driveway access and how that might impact existing? Have you had any conversations at all? Not at this point. Okay. They would be allowed to have a driveway, and so we'll make whatever improvements would be necessary. All right. Any other? Mr. Hahn. Ms. Wolf, um, can you share with us the the finished grade relative to the existing elevation? There's a fair amount of slope, and um, I guess sloping from south to north, and um, the, the current there is. current grade is pretty well below the 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 access road to the condominiums and. Uh, the, it is. There's the a difference of described. about six feet. I mean, it's very effective. But mm -hmm. anyway, I'll, I'll be quiet and let you address. No, I'm the, sorry. Uh, I, there is a berm along the driveway and along the back property line. Um, then it goes down towards where the two buildings that we will be using are. Uh, that difference is basically seven feet from the spot elevation of the roadway down to the lowest part of the site. So you don't anticipate any um, substantial fill on any part of the property? No. Okay. There'd be no reason. It's a crot. We would be running with the contours as far as flattening out for the drive that would go to the rear building when that building is ever built. And the building itself would be obviously graded out to a flat, but that's only at a, two contours. Okay. Thank you. Two feet. 
and Miss Wolf, while we're on that topic, um, and I, I, I think a lot of that movement is that berm that sh that's showing up. Um, but t talk to us. Obviously, you haven't designed it, a stormwater pond. You know it's required. You've placed it. Where do you think that would outlet? Just I'm looking at it. It looks fairly landlocked, and I'm just I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are. It would outlet along the northern boundary, which is where the water goes now, and out to the highway system. Okay, so that, that's that's the pattern you're you're anticipating. That's correct. The out, the stormwater pond would have an overflow outlet, and it would go along that northern property line. There is a utility easement already there. I'm not sure exactly what utilities are in it. They go back to Sellers Cove, so we would parallel it. And that was, I was going to ask what utilities were in that, but you, you don't know yet. Okay. I'm guessing that they're more uh, dry utilities. Or, yes. Okay. Um, okay. That was my only question. Mm -hmm. What other questions? Mr. Moore? Ms. Wolf, one of the conditions here that staff has um, put forth that's basically controlling the exterior lighting on the site and it has some maximum illumination levels. What is actually going to be lit on this site? Are any of the structures going to be lit up as far as the warehouse or the office? The warehouse would obviously that. have some type of security lighting wall mounted towards the doors. Okay. Um, even though it would be security fenced, okay. the site itself. Um, the front buildings, again, wall mounted to uh, light the porch, maybe the door into the packing, the small storage building. As far as around the site, absolutely, they would want some lighting to uh, light up where the the stock, the trucks sure. and trailers would be stored. Sure. Okay. But those are limited to 12 feet. So truly, the condition that is there is chapter and verse of what is in the code already. But we bring it forward and, and commit to it over and over. And in this particular case, added the 12 foot height for poles. Okay. I, I'm asking, and this may be really just, and I think you clarified it there for me, is I've seen some sites where we have a lot of LED lighting on the outside, and I'm assuming that this condition from a staff perspective, Mr. Biddle, is somewhat to address that. Is that a correct statement? Because I know the county doesn't really go too far in depth on exterior lighting when it gets to LEDs and stuff around the edges of the buildings. Um, even if you've got gas stations and underneath the gas stations on the exterior. So that's why I'm asking that question. All right. That's correct, sir. Okay. But Thank in you. this particular case, the only thing that's at the back there is that building, and three sides of it are solid. There's no exit doors. There's no reason for the lighting at the back of the building. All right. Any other questions for the applicant? All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much Ms. Wolf. This time I would like to open the public hearing up to the op opposition. I have two people signed up. Um, and just a reminder, we have 15 minutes. Um, I guess two people, that's probably not, not that big of an issue. Um, yeah, and I'm Mr. speaking to for all of Sellers Cove. Okay, are you Mr. Harris? Eric. Yes, I am Mr. Harris. All right, great. If you just yeah, tell your name and address. And uh, my name is uh, Eric Harris. I uh, live at 632 Condo Club Drive, Unit 205. Uh, for 16 years, Carolina, uh, for 16, 16 years, the residents of Sellers Cove have long enjoyed the cove of isolation from the hustle and bustle of Wilmington and Carolina Beach Road. So obviously, when we first heard of this project, we were alarmed. Some of us were fearful. Many of us were angry. A lot of us were both. When we, um, so when we reached out, um, well, as, as I established, I am going to be speaking on behalf of all of the homeowners and residents of Sellers Cove today. We have uh, had multiple community meetings about this, sat in on the informational meeting held by Ms. Wolf and her associate, and we've, uh, if I had uh, uh, all the time in the world, and if there were enough coffee in the world, I could speak to all of our points. Instead, today, I'm going to focus on a lot of the critical ones and just refer you to the public comment submissions, which I understand to be many, uh, that address the remaining concerns uh, shared by members in our community. 
So one thing I do want to start off with stating is that this project is clearly, there are really two independent concerns th uh, that aren't necessarily that cross-related. First, there is the U-Haul, I'll uh, continue to use that uh, phrasing uh, with respect to the actual U-Haul uh, 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 representatives. And uh, the secondly, there is the uh, pods or U-Box storage that they plan to put on site. After doing a lot of, uh, of research, we have come to the, uh, well, I want to start with the latter, talking about the uh, warehouse and the pods and U-Box or U-Box storage that will go there. Many of us, uh, we, after doing a lot of research and digging through a lot of the documentation through that the county has available on the public website, we have come to the, uh, uh, to the opinion that this is actually not consistent with B2, uh, is not consistent with the zoning ordinance, and not consistent with the broader comprehensive plan, and we will explain why. This is uh, for B2 office and warehouse. But as uh, Ms. Wolf has stated, this is first of all not many self storage. As these are, you know, free. Uh, these are, are not stationary units that people have independent access to. Nor is it a warehouse of distributable goods, much as much like that uh, shared in the Unified Development Ordinance Manual with the image of Bayside Electric Supply. Instead, we are getting a, a warehouse filled with pods or U boxes which are essentially cargo containers. And, uh, you know, what I want to uh, point out is the distinction in uh, the principal use definition. When you're dealing with cargo containers, it really changes that dynamic of what is actually going to be uh, used in this, uh, what this warehouse is going to be for. One of the best use that we found is on page 38 of the New Hanover County Unified Development Ordinance, where it reads, motor freight transportation warehousing, a business, service, or industry involving the use of commercial vehicles in the loading, unloading, and transportation of cargo. It may also include the fueling, maintenance, servicing, storage, or repair of commercial vehicles, or, and I want to emphasize this, the storage of cargo. So the use of commercial vehicles in the loading, unloading, and transportation of these cargo units and the storage of cargo. Now, essentially, uh, let's not make any mistake about this. Most of the pods in the U-Box uh, advertising all talk about being able to pack up your stuff and move it across country if need be. We're talking place to place, city to city, coast to coast. This can even involve fl modified flatbed trucks like that shown in this photograph or it could even involve 18-wheeler uh, semi-trucks. Uh, so the, o the other thing in terms of the storage, I mean, this is a, a, a storage warehouse for storing cargo. These are freight containers. And I want to point out that, um, you know, in Miss Wolf's sketch of what this, this will be in this warehouse, this is a 32-foot warehouse, and on it she has outlined <laughs> 30, uh, at least 30 slots for 16 by 8 cargo containers. This warehouse is going to be at least, tw or at most, 25 feet tall as per the recommendations in the comprehensive plan and the ordinance, which means it is very easy to assume uh, and safe to assume that these pods will be stacked. That means that you can have up to 60 of these 16 by 8 containers stored in this warehouse. And if you substitute that with the 8x8 containers that many of these vendors uh, uh, advertise as their smaller option, that estimate can go up to a capacity of 120 containers stored in this warehouse. That is no small-scale operation. And the fact that these can and possibly will be uh, facilitated in moving people from one city to another, even perhaps across the, the continent, this is a major shipping operation. This is not a small, uh, trivial operation. This is not just a mini warehouse. It is a, a smaller piece of a larger logistical puzzle. This is a shipping business. And I, I probably goes without saying with this group that motor freight transportation warehousing is not permitted in districts zoned B2. And this is as per Table 4.2.1 
under the new Hanover County Unified Development Ordinance. Furthermore, I would go to assert that this is also not consistent with the county's comprehensive plan, as this is not drive-by business, not the warehouse portion, as these are storage containers that don't require drive-by business to function. And the comprehensive plan in Chapter 4 for the community mixed-use place type specifies that lower-density commercial and industrial developments are incompatible. The only codes in which motor uh, freight and transportation can be applied are CS, AC, I-1, and I-2, all of which are more consistent with what can be allowed on the northern side of New Hanover County in the more industrial and commerce-oriented areas. Not in uh, the down the, the Carolina Beach corridor where the Sellers Cove community is, and most certainly not on the lot for which the application has been applied. Also, I would like to point out other competing businesses uh, to help further support the fact that this is not a, uh, a, a, a business that belongs in the community mixed use. The only two competitors that we can immediately find is Badger Box and Coastal Mobile Storage, both of which are on the other side of town and in the place type uh, that are designated as employment center. Furthermore, even the U-Box storage uh, facility that is currently up there on Market Street, uh, while that is within uh, what I believe to be within city, uh, city of Wilmington city limits and therefore not really highlighted on the future land use map, it is, however, adjacent to land on that future land use map that is similarly uh, labeled as employment center. So it would probably, more than likely, if it were an unincorporated area, would still be under the employment center place type, not community mixed use. Now, pivoting over to the U-Haul side of the business or the moving rent truck rental side of the business, I would like to point out that there are already two other rental facilities within a three-mile radius, actually three if you count Penske. And uh, so that is 4905 Carolina Beach Road, which is only three and a half miles to the north, and 7275 Carolina Beach Road, which is 2.8 miles to the south. We don't really need another U-Haul uh, haul facility uh, to support the nature of our people. I mean, how many do you really need within a certain mile radius to support the needs of the, uh, of the county? Furthermore, I would even go to point out that as per the uh, application, it says in the application that they expect only four trips uh, on that driveway during peak hours. If that is a good faith estimate as to the traffic that they really expect into this property, this business is going out of business before it even opens the doors. That is just not enough flow to really support and generate enough revenue to do anything, let alone support for employees. So all the technical stuff aside, I do want to address many of the community concerns. I am trying to be mindful of the time, so I'll get through as many as I can. I, I, we have about six outlined, but uh, if I run short, I'll just jump to the conclusion and refer you to the uh, 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 submissions via the public comment forum. <coughs> concerns one through two uh, are involving the effects from the proximity of the warehouse to Sellers Cove. I would like to point out that this warehouse uh, is a, about 100 feet from the windows and balconies of our easternmost building, which is 645 Condo Club Drive. One of the first uh, uh, concerns that we do have with this warehouse is noise, clamorous warehouse noise. Now, I understand uh, that Ms. Wolf commented that there won't be a lot of forklift use, but remember, these are, are going to be, a, this is a warehouse filled with stacked metal containers, possibly as many as 120 containers. There's going to be a lot of movement going on in this warehouse to shuffle things about. What happens if you need to get that one pod in the back that's buried by two other pods? You're going to have to go in, drag the two pods that are on top of it out, pull it out, and by the way, you're pulling everything out of the warehouse because they don't have that much room to maneuver in this place. And then they're going to have to repack the warehouse. That is a lot of movement. The, uh, the whirring of these uh, forklift engines is going to be unbearable. The beeping is going to be unbearable. The, the 
clamorous noise of these uh, containers being uh, moved, set down, picked up again, and moved back into the warehouse is going to be unbearable. Imagine you are a retiree sitting on your balcony trying to finish the, 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 Sudo the latest Sudoku puzzle. Or maybe you, like me, are a professional who works from home and has to conduct client meetings over Zoom. Or maybe you are an ER nurse and you have to, uh, that works the night shift and you need to sleep during the day in order to be fresh uh, and ready to go uh, in your job that saving people's lives in the evening. It is going to be impossible to do any of these things with this noise happening just 100 feet from your window. And mind you, the, uh, whether this is, uh, whether they, they may assure us that this will only happen during business hours, but the, for these groups, business hours or off business hours are meaningless. I mean, a lot of us work from home. We have a lot of retirees. You have people that sleep during the day. You can't just uh, uh, say that, oh yeah, well, this is not gonna matter because that's, uh, you know, the, all, uh, you're sleeping and doing all this stuff in the evening. No, we cannot simply assume that, not in today's uh, uh, marketplace, job market. The second thing that we are concerned about is hazardous materials. You know, when we, uh, during the informational meeting that we had with uh, Ms. Wolf and Mr. Dundee, it was, uh, we posed this question about, well, uh, that we are fearful that there could be hazardous materials in these containers, to which they assured us that customers must sign agreements saying that they will not put hazardous materials in these containers. But after we prodded further, we learned that they have no practice or no policy uh, in place to actually screen these containers to ensure that these policies are being abided by. This agreement that customers sign becomes little more than a liability waiver for the business. It is not a safety guarantee for the uh, residents of the Sellers Cove community. We are the ones who would have to pay the price if something goes wrong. It is our lives, it is our property who is at stake. Uh, for them, it's just a matter of the insurance company and passing liability off to the uh, customer so that they don't get sued. Which brings me to my next point. Uh, we do have a lot of retirees and immunocompromised people in our community, and that raises a lot of concerns over air quality. Um, According to the EPA, major roadways can influence air quality of up to 600 feet. 645 Condo Club Drive sits back approximately 450 feet from Carolina Beach Road. I checked this on uh, Google Earth multiple times before coming, and I'm sure that can be verified uh, by more official measurements later on uh, as if this project proceeds forward. But the problem is that this, uh, currently we enjoy a buffer of, uh, of, of all this, this greener. We have a large vegetative buffer. And I see that my time is running short. I will hurry up and cut to the uh, conclusion. With the loss of 25 trees, that means loss of natural protective barrier. The one that they want to introduce is gonna take years to mature to growth. That is not gonna be a sufficient barrier in enough time to immediately uh, uh, mitigate the impacts of the loss of at least 21 trees. And then you have the added vehicles, which is noise pollution. We also have concerns about the obstructed visibility to our driveway, which by the way, this is a photograph that was conveniently timed, taken by one of my uh, neighbors, Ms. Diaz, who, that shows a, a garbage truck right at the entry of this turning lane. Mind you, this uh, driveway is gonna go right at the very point where that uh, uh, turning lane is still maturing. It would have barely reached its full maturation and width before the, the proposed driveway begins. And this is only about 150, 160 feet from Sellers Cove. Our fear is that this obstruction is going to create an issue uh, that's gonna drive more accidents for us getting out of the driveway, which is already difficult. And I will cut down to my conclusion. Uh, ultimately, ultimately, it's not just that we don't want this here. It is that we can't have this here. So therefore, we implore you, we ask you as the planning board to first uh, examine the, 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 the use cases for this property and what county ordinance actually says about it. Listen to the 100 plus voices who are proud to call Sellers Cove their home. Consider our safety, our health, and our well-being uh, as you make your decision. And lastly, we implore you we implore you to please recommend denial of this zoning request. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank you very much.
Um, we have another speaker signed up, but I will, I'll pull you in on the, we have a five minute rebuttal period, so I'll pull you in at that time. We'll, we'll get you. Um, at this time, I'd like to go back to the applicant and their five minute rebuttal period. Um, Ms. Wolf. Thank you. Uh, there's not a lot to say. Um, I'll defer to the county attorney. Um, this type of use for vehicle rental is a very specific use category in our charts. It is permitted in B2. As I said, Enterprise, Hertz. Yes, they rent cars. They also rent trucks. We have them all over town, and they are not in only industrial districts. Uh, the pod storage has become basically an accessory use for these types of businesses and also some of the mini storage businesses. So it is not considered industrial or cargo moving. And I believe that the size of the containers are indicative of that exact point. Um, I'm not even sure that they're metal. I think they're plastic. But regardless, they're hazardous materials. We can only go by what we know of laws and protections that are part of every business. Um, how do we know that there isn't a resident, <laughs> and this is silly, but of Sellers Cove with hazardous materials? None of us can know that. We strive to do our best to follow the laws and um, that. The, I mean, I, I guess I don't really have much in the way of rebuttal because I don't feel that any of his basis for opposition was valid in this particular case. This is generally set up to be a business district along this corridor. Again, the two lots beside it are his own business now. If those lots were for sale and a deal had been cut between my client and those lot owners, then we would be there tomorrow. So as far as a reasonable use, the advantage of the conditional district process is that these folks are getting additional uh, mitigation for the use that we're proposing. I, I, I mean, unless there's questions, I don't really have anything that I can offer in addition. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Wolf. I don't see any questions for you. Thank you very much. Then we will um, switch back to the opposition. Um, and we have one more speaker signed up, um, Ms. Martha. And I don't want to mis misstate your last name. But if you, if you would tell us your name and address, please, ma'am. My name is Martha Afetse. I reside at 645 Condo Club Drive. I do live within a hundred feet of this project. Okay. My bedroom directly, my windows, I sleep, the air comes in, the cross section of the air that I can get in my apartment comes from that, from that direction. So I am opposed to this project and I am asking that you really consider us as the residents in that area, that when we look at your master plan, going back to 1969, 2010, 2016, the, you know, the upgrading of the master plan, when we look at it, one of the things that jumps out to me what in the master plan, or now you call it the comprehensive plan, quote, our natural areas are critical to the health and well-being of our citizens. That's us. That's our health. The population, including the city of Wilmington, 214,000, expected to increase by 57% by 2040, according to the master plan which increases the population within this county, incorporated and unincorporated, to 341,000. Now by 2021 already, we are already up to 229,018 residents in this, in this county. The growth 
will have a direct impact on the ability of future generations to thrive and enjoy the natural environment. That comes right out of the comprehensive plan. These are your words. So the goal you had fostering the economic development of the county, now that does not always strike a balance between economic development and environmental stewardship. In chapter three of that master plan, there were sightings of livable environments, harmony with nature, interwoven equity, resilient economy, healthy community. And one of the things in your plan that is noted is that the chronic respiratory disease in New Hanover County, the leading cause is from an unhealthy environment, toxins. And they are estimating that the residents between the more cases, 40, the people between 40 years of age and 85 years of age, which I'm gradually getting there, will die from toxics in the environment. I was born here in Wilmington, North Carolina. In 1874, my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather purchased all of that land out there by go gas, all of that, the post office. That was Elijah Moore's land. It has been taken over by commercial development. Now, I'm all for progress, but I am certainly opposed to businesses having priority over the quality of life that we live in the community. When I wake up in the morning, I don't want to be breathing the fumes. It is already the toxic noise from living in a three-story building is already a problem because you got noise on top of you, and then in your second floor, you got the noise from upstairs, and the people downstairs got the noise from on the second floor. So we're already inundated with noise. So we're asking you, we are appealing to you to consider us and not allow our lives to be impacted by commercial development all because we're looking for economic progress. We're dying. We're dying as the elderly people in this community. You see the gray on my hair? I am 76 years old, born here in Wilmington, North Carolina. I have a cousin back here that just sold land over there on the Rosa Parks. That was part of Elijah Moore's 1874 purchase. Please, don't do this to us. So I am appealing to you to have some consideration for the quality of life that we live in this community. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, this time I'd, let's see. Oh, any staff review or additional conditions? Um, Mr. Chair, I will mention that um, Mr. Hip did request that if someone were to make a motion to approve the request, um, that an additional condition locating um, any dumpster by the supply storage would be something he would request. Um, and there has been some conversation tonight about the mix of uses on the property. Um, so for clarity's sake, um, it may be appropriate for condition one to also reference the associated um, moving truck and equipment um, rental that Ms. Wolf mentioned. Thank you very much. All right, at this time I'd like to close the public hearing and open the table for board discussion. Mr. Avery. Uh, does the, I haven't looked closely. Does the zoning orders define what cargo is, what freight is, and what is considered cargo or freight in a storage pod for household goods? It does not. Those are some of the terms that are not defined in the ordinance itself, but it does reference it would be the general dictionary definition of those terms. Thank you. 
Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, to Mr. Avery's comment, uh, um, our architecture firm has worked with some larger transportation and cargo companies, um, and there's no transportation or cargo company that could get by with 2,400 square feet. These are 200 square foot, 200,000 square foot facilities. I believe the interpretation that staff uh, has made uh, seems correct. I don't, I don't believe that they have incorrectly um, determined the use uh, in, this, in this situation. I appreciate the, 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 the passion and, and concern that it was presented, but I don't believe that the staff made an incorrect assumption on the uh, designated use. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Hill. Mr. Avery. Uh, also, <clears throat> at some point, if this gets approved and they build that building back there, particularly the building with the storage, it'll have to go through a building permit review process. The fire service is gonna be all over that because it's a storage building. It may require sprinkler. It may depend on how high the stacking is, but there is an. It, they will be looking at what's stored there and how if it's hazardous or not hazardous, and how they're going to deal with it. So, but they have to do that in their permit process. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Mr. Moore. So maybe it's really two questions. So just to make sure I clarify, or clarification for me. Sorry, just to make sure I clarify for myself, so U-Haul is not a use that is going to be on this property. I just, Ms. Wolf, can you make sure you address that because I've heard two sides now. That particular business is not what we're referring to. Okay. We are referring to vehicle, moving vehicle and equipment rental. Okay, all right, I just want to make sure that is clarified. If yes, fully absolutely. The and other question I have is really for Mr. Biddle. In a B2, what are just generally 10,000 altitude use, some of the uses that are allowed? So obviously we have two properties to the north of this that are zoned currently as right now B2. Yes, sir. What could be permitted by right? In other words, we don't see each other in that process. So everything from uh, like a Home Depot type of uh, box hardware store to uh, Zep High's Pizza Parlor, which is two parcels north along uh, Carolina Beach Road. Um, B2 is generally seen along uh, commercial highway uh, items. So it's like our most extensive commercial use uh, before we start looking at industrial uh, land uses. Okay, is it safe to say that there's probably a good 80 to 100 plus uses allowed in that? It's probably our most robust okay. uh, op, uh, land uh, zone. That's a fair way to district. address it, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Matthews. First, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, it's obviously that you've got a very tight, unified neighborhood, and I drove through there in very nice homes. Um, some objections have been raised to the uses, or this particular use. But I will tell you, regardless of what happens tonight, the the parcel that is immediately east of your your uh, common area, the, the swimming pool, is on B2. I will tell you for a fact, within the past 24 months, that property was first under contract for a car wash. It did not move forward because of some questions that they had about water capacity at that time. Secondarily, it was under contract for six months for an oil change. So these are just two of the roughly 100 uses that Mr. Bill just mentioned. Um, there are others, fast food, um, auto parts stores, just you know, multi, multi tenant retail centers. Um, regardless of what happens on this corner, there's a lot that are, is already permitted by right. And if that really concerns you, you need to be aware, aware that it's, it's a reality. Uh, secondarily, um, looking at this particular tract and looking, looking at what they have proposed to do uh, to provide buffer looks like an honest attempt. I mean, I, I would be open to hear, you know, particular subject, suggestions on, on buffering, but um, 
I think they've done a, a commendable job with, with what they've got to work with, uh, both in the area uh, behind that building and what they intend to plant there, which are very, very fast growing trees. Someone, and I believe it was Mr. Hip, brought up the question of security fencing. And I'm wondering if the applicant would consider a condition to, to put any security fencing inside the buffer, landscaping buffer perimeter so that it would not be up against that entrance road and, and folks would not see that or once everything's mature, would not see that when they went into their, their neighborhood. We'll discuss it and, and, and get back to us see when, whenever. I, I can easily say that, yes. Um, we have, we still have a 20 foot buffer along their entrance road. Mm -hmm. And so all of those spaces that are shown along there are already 20 foot back and the security fencing would be on the face of those spaces. Across the back, it would be at the face of the building on the Carolina Beach Road side. So yes, there would be no visibility of these fences from those two viewpoints. Right. And that would be an acceptable condition to make sure that's the case, that it's not on the property line. Okay, thank you. You can note that, that condition. Um, beyond that, that's, that's my comments. I have just a few more uh, related to some of the comments from the opposition again who, who um, I appreciate their their uh, position but as we have seen I've been on this uh, this might be my one year anniversary actually tonight it's my one year on this on this uh, planning board um, and this is uh, in my opinion the least impactful rezoning that I think I've seen um, as far as it comes to the residential neighbors um, the as designed the, the, the proposed building is only 25 feet the uh, the condo buildings are 35 feet uh, the the 25 foot building is set about seven feet below the grade of the uh, condo buildings that reducing the height in itself um, the building as designed is further from the condos than the condos are to themselves. These condos appear, the, the central condos, um, the western condos are roughly 40 feet apart. The condo, uh, the eastern condo is roughly 70 feet from the two condos on, on the west. Uh, th this is not an impactful um, use, not, not an, a great negative impact to the condos at least compared to some of the other things I've seen. So I, I believe the design, the use can fit with the community, the buffer yard along uh, Condo Club Drive uh, with trees and the, and, the, and the berm demonstrate that you can't see into the property or it's very hard to see into the property. So I'm, I'm, I personally am in, in favor of, of, of the application as submitted with the several additional conditions that we discussed tonight. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Hip. Actually, Ms. Richards. Thank you, Chair Petrock. In um, following up with Ms. Roth's recommendation about discussing with there's any um, vehicle rental or what the primary business is, when you look and make your decisions as to the pr proposed conditions, on number one, you can add, if you so wish, to have any kind of vehicle rental as an ancillary to the primary use if that becomes a concern for this to turn into a car rental lot or anything else if it should be sold. Just wanted to put that out before. All right, actually, would you say that one more time? You can add at the end of that that any <clears throat> vehicle rental would be an ancillary use okay. to the primary uses of private business, offices for private business and professional activities and warehousing. Thank you very much. If you so choose. You're welcome. Any questions for Ms. Richards on that? <laughs> do, do we have to consider that? I mean, <clears throat> no, just following up from what Ms. Roth said, if you'd like to add that, that would be a way to do it. And if not, that's your decision. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
All right, any further discussion? All right. Um, well, I'd like to, before we proceed with a vote um, and a motion, I'd like to invite the applicant back up to the podium. And based on board discussion and items presented during the public hearing, would you like to withdraw your petition, um, request a continuance, or proceed with a vote? We would like to proceed and agree with the conditions that have been suggested. All right, thank you very much. Is there a, a motion on the table? Mr. Hepp? So moved. Uh, uh, Ed, a motion to accept, um, oh, I have to read the whole thing, I'm sorry. Again, I've only been here a year. All right, so uh, yes, I would like to make a motion for uh, a recommendation of approval of the application. Um, and I will read, I move to recommend approval of the proposed rezoning to find, I find it to be consistent with the purposes and intent of the comprehensive plan because the proposed limited commercial uses are generally encouraged in the community mixed use place type and would serve nearby existing and future residential developments. I also find recommending approval of the rezoning request is reasonable and in the public interest because the project reduces estimated traffic impacts to the adjacent roadway and would act as an appropriate transition between highway and neighboring high density residential development with the following conditions. Um, and I'll preface all this by saying that I hope our attorney will correct any mistakes I might make. The proposed conditions, number one, uses shall be limited to offices for private business and professional activities and warehousing. Any vehicle rental will be, will be an ancillary use to the main uses as described. Two, a minimum 20 foot wide buffer dedicate, 20 foot wide dedicated public access easement shall be required extending from the northern property line to the southern property line parallel to Carolina Beach Road. Adjustments to the location of the easement along Carolina Beach Road may be approved administratively by planning staff due to landscaping, tree preservation, driveway access, or utility requirements. No commercial RV or boat storage shall be permitted on site. Excuse me, that was number three. Number four, no, no outdoor storage of temporary or containers, uh, pod-like storage containers shall be permitted on site. Five, the warehouse structure's maximum allowed building height is 25 feet. Six, exterior lighting, including luminaries and security lights, shall be arranged or shielded so as not to cast illumination in an upward direction above an imaginary line extended from the light sources parallel to the ground. Fixtures shall be numbered such that adequate levels of lighting are, are maintained, but that light spillage and glare are not directed to adjacent properties harboring neighboring areas or motorists. Light posts shall be no taller than 12 feet. Number seven, the entire 35 foot wide setback behind the building shall be reserved as a buffer yard. No activity shall occur in that area. Two, staggered rows of Leland cypress or some other evergreen shrub that grows a minimum of 15 to 20 feet in height will be planted along the rear property boundary in addition to the prescribed type A opaque buffer option one, requiring a minimum of three rows of evergreen shrubs that shall be a minimum of six feet in height and provide full visual opacity within one year of planting. And uh, two additionals that we've added uh, would be number eight, um, that uh, any security fencing would be placed on the um, uh, pro on, on would not be would be placed on the property owner side of all buffer yards. Does that sound reasonable? And then uh, number nine was uh, that any uh, dumpster uh, dumpsters for the facility be located centrally uh, central in the property adjacent near the administrative offices. Sound reasonable? I believe you met, hit all of them. Yes. Thank you. Is that your all motion? Right. We, That's my motion. We second. Have a motion. We have second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes seven to zero. 
And I will remind everyone that this item goes before the county commissioners on Monday, November 6th, and that meeting will begin at 4 p.m. in this location. Um, thank you for, for coming tonight. We do have other matters, um, so if you could file out outside, I'd appreciate that. Next item. Yes. Yes, sir. All right, we'll roll into item number two. Um, this is, let's see, TA 23-03, EV charging stations, um, Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment. Um, Mr. Dickerson. Thank you, Chair, members of the board. The text amendment we are presenting for your consideration tonight is a staff-led initiative that we have been working towards for several months now. Staff presented the concepts last fall, brought them back this past spring, and then spent the summer working to get input from the local development community prior to finalizing the public comment draft. We released draft amendments for public comment on September 8th. We held a two-week public comment period ending September 22nd and are now coming back to you with a revised draft. This amendment is a staff-led initiative stemming from a management directive, which was given to us last year, as there is recent legislation on both the federal and state level regarding electric vehicle EV goals, as well as part of the county's efforts to proactively address the future needs of residents through planned growth and development. This graph represents the numbers of EVs registered in New Hanover County. Years 2024 to 2026 are estimated based on current rate of change. As these vehicles take a larger hold in the market, there will be changing demands for parking facilities where users can charge their vehicles. This map depicts locations of level two charging stations from the Department of Energy. This amendment is intended to make it as easy and cost effective for property owners to install EV charging stations in the future when it becomes feasible and or necessary. While the market is changing and it is uncertain at this time how many EV stations will be necessary in a future market, this amendment helps set up property and business owners to be able to retrofit more easily for a lower upfront cost. The first part of the amendment covers the expansion of the definition of electric vehicle charging station, along with additions explaining the charging levels. We have expanded this definition so that in the future, when charging stations are anticipated to become more common, these types of chargers are already covered. The amendment includes new standards for minimum percentage of electric vehicle ready spaces, along with defining what an EV ready space is. The proposed amendment states that in developments where 25 or more spaces are required for the use, a minimum of 20% of these spaces must be EV ready. We are requiring 20% of conduit because this is the most cost effective way to prepare for the future. The information available is evolving quickly. The numbers that were provided to you in your staff report do not reflect the current registration numbers as provided by NCDOT, which was updated earlier this week. Currently, based on information we can find, it does appear that the market is keeping up with the numbers of charging stations are needed, but many of these are in particular areas of town and some are only able to be accessed privately, such as in gated apartment communities. Thus, the needs of citizens are not being served. Staff did receive public comment about removing the language requiring wires to be installed at build-out because the wires may deteriorate over the time from initial build-out to installation of charging stations. This section of the amendment outlines provisions for the EV parking space design requirements, including equipment protection and signage. This signage can help to ensure that there are basic standards so that residents and tourists alike can easily tell the difference between spaces. The last section of the amendment outlines minimum standards for accessible EV parking spaces. 
The intent of this section is to provide for ADA parking spaces for EV drivers, as the ADA standards currently do not outline EV parking design requirements. The best practices recommend that local governments cover this in their ordinances until the federal government makes revisions to ADA standards for this. Staff is recommending a motion to approve the text amendment. We have received two total public comments, one in opposition citing the current status of the market and that this amendment may not be necessary, and one that did not indicate support or opposition but had a suggestion for edits to the language and a question about putting a cap on numbers of spaces required for larger projects. Staff did not find other municipalities that had included a cap or sliding scale for larger projects, but have followed best practice guidelines in drafting this amendment. After your recommendation tonight, this item will be scheduled to move forward to the Board of Commissioners at their November 6th meeting for a public hearing and final decision. Thank you for your time tonight. I'm glad to answer any questions that you might have. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Dickerson. Any Mr. Chair, I do have a yes. question. Mr. Dickerson, can you, uh, I heard something in your presentation, but it slipped past me so fast. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the installation of conduit and wire or no wire? No wire. Uh, one of the initial drafts did have wire in there. We received public comment to re that recommended removal of that language because the wire itself could deteriorate over the time from installation of the conduit and wire to when the charging station actually goes in. So what I, what I printed out seemed to still have the wire in there. Did I? It, I'll bring you a copy of the full packet to make sure you have the okay. most that, that actually was going to be one of my comments. So if it is gone, then I think that's probably a... It is uh, gone in the, the draft that should have been provided to the board. It was crossed out in blue, um, which is our practice for when we show removal of language. I may have printed the wrong one. I apologize. No, no worries. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yes, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and Mr. Dixon, we don't, we don't actually have anyone signed up in support or opposition. Um, so I think really I need to open the board up for, for discussion and, and I'm sure there are gonna be questions if you okay. would hang out right there. Yes. Um, and, and we have all received some, several emails, um, primarily in opposition. Um, and so, again, I, I just wanna open up to the board and, um, I mean, discussion. I mean, I'll Mr. just Stanley? ask a question right off the bat. I mean, the <clears throat> we did get a comment on it. I know it was referred to in the presentation. I mean, the the twenty um, the twenty five or more total parking spaces um, requirement, and then I guess be at least five spaces or twenty percent. I mean, if there is um, a considerable, if this is a, a large project. I mean that. Without it being capped, I mean, we could have a situation where there is a large amount of EV spaces that would be required, based, you know, depending upon the project. I mean, has staff considered, you know, capping that at something that's more realistic? I mean, I know the example that was given in the comments was, you know, of a 600 parking space mm -hmm. um, would be 120 EV units. Right. EV park. I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> We did receive that comment and we looked into it. We didn't see other municipalities that had put a cap on it, um, so there wasn't really a guideline to go by, um, nor did we receive a recommendation for where to cap that at, um, such as at, at what point does it start to scale off or do we put a cap on it? Um, though if, if, if you all think it's a good idea, it's something we can definitely look into. <clears throat> Mr. Jacobson, I've got a question. Did, in, in your... I guess kind of research of, of other municipalities did, did you find any of that really differentiated um, res, uh, residential and, and commercial um, requirements for these types of EV stations and when I say residential I of course mean uh, apartments mm -hmm. condos those types of things multifamily more commonly, it was a, a flat percentage across the board. Um, I will cite one example. The city of Apex in Wake County does differentiate out by a couple different uses. Um, they go between 15% for some commercial, and their multifamily baseline is 30%. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you. What, what other discussion points? I think one that w was brought up um, about the... The, the, oh gosh, I've lost this spot. The, 
the let's see, not just the conduit, but the uh, space in the in the not the transformer, but the circuit, the circuit space. Okay. Um, some feedback we've gotten, uh, not a lot, but a little bit, was was some concerns on that, and I think it's it's valid to to discuss a little further, because I don't know enough about um, how some of these larger um, stations could be served if if we do have a large parking lot and we have a uh, hundred or or more EV mm -hmm. stations, if that could be served by its own uh, transformer uh, without having to go into the building, have a dedicated circuit, and then come to the, the parking lot. Any, have you seen anything on that or any thoughts on that? That was when I talked to, um, I spoke with Sarah Warmoth, who's the facilities management director for the county, and we talked about this specifically. Okay. Um, I think the intent of the language was to provide for that eventual, the capacity for future retrofit. Certainly companies like Tesla, for example, when they come in, they often do install their own transformer because that's their proprietary system. Um, I think to some degree it would be up to the developer or the property owner. Um, the intent of the language is to make it one requirement for that. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. It's something we looked into, but of course none of us are electricians. Um, so. Yes, yes, Mr. Mr. Moore. I first, I want to applaud staff. Yeah. Um, I know y'all have spent a lot, lot of time on this. Um, what is it now, a year, give or take, kind of coming back? So the challenge with me in the industry that I am, when I see circuit breaker, I think of the conduit running up to essentially what is known as a D-square box. So when you look outside your house, you've got a, mm -hmm. basically the, the amp box. You're going to look at a circuit breaker as me putting in some type of amperage, some type of system to where it's either 15, 10, 20, or something that turns things off. And so I don't like that terminology because to me we say we run conduit with no wire, but I can't run a circuit breaker unless I know what the amperage of the wire that I'm running. And so I reached out to a couple folks today. Once you get past 10 spaces, you move up into conduit. There's two, two sections of conduit that you're going to use, size types, 2 inch and 4 inch. Once you get to 10 spaces, you're at a four inch conduit. And you may have to go more because once you go past 10, you can only run so much line into a conduit. It jams up at some point. Mm -hmm. So that was my biggest challenge. Um, I understand what you're trying to do, but essentially what you're trying to do is just stub up conduit for the future developer to come in and install EV either with Tesla or whoever or where the market is going at that time. I would say take that out and let the market dictate from the conduit section unless we can get to better terminology because circuit breaker tells me I've got to put something in. So that would be my major comment, Jeff. I know we talked about it a little bit, but I'm struggling with that one. Now, to Colin's point, I am really struggling with the percentage. Um, I understand philosophically only multifamily um, because I do understand that single family in new construction right now, we are actually going in as a marketing tool, you can call it for what it is, putting in dead wire systems to where essentially you can come in as a homeowner mm -hmm. if you own a hybrid or a BEV and you can install your own plug after the fact. Um, many builders are starting to adopt that. I'm seeing that more and more. Mm -hmm. Now that's at the residential side, whereas you jump to multifamily, you obviously don't have that single family car garage, although we are starting to see multifamily starting to have garage spaces in some capacity. So you would need probably some more spaces. But when we jump to the commercial aspect, and I'll use a very, so one that's just right there in front of me nonstop is the Smithfields. Mm -hmm. um, they put in within their retrofits. Now this ordinance wouldn't apply to them or behind them where big, big lots was retrofitted essentially it was just two commercial upfits change out mm -hmm. because there was no expansion of parking lot. So I want to look at those as being new. Let's just say they were new. They're within spitting distance of 100 yards of each other. And Tesla put in two charging stations 
that I rarely see cars sitting in. Matter of fact, the manager that runs the Smithfields, because I do, we do a lot of catering with them, is one of those that puts his car in there nonstop. Um, there's 52 parking spaces at that site. Based on this ordinance, if that was new, there would be 10 EV parking spaces. That to me is overkill. Conduit or not, it's just, it's just overkill to me. In addition, if that was built as a facility, and let's say that right after that, then the next, where Big Lots was and all that was developed, um, I didn't count out how many parking spaces, that, but there's more than 200. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is just when your numbers say that we need X more EV stations or ready EV areas, just in that area alone, we would pretty much meet your demand. And that, that's why I'm challenged with the commercial. I'm finding that percentage to be very difficult. The two to me is fine. I look at Mayfair. They've got probably about 15 right there, right in front of the belts. There's maybe one or two cars in those, using those EVs at any given moment. You look over at um, the ones that are just put in uh, in front of West Marine. I think there's three sitting there. And same thing, I see one or two cars. I actually see more there because of Starbucks, because you've got a higher end clientele that is using Starbucks to actually use that. And that's one thing I'm also hearing from our guys on the multifamily side, is that they're finding the market is driving in the higher end multifamily, more of the charging stations because the clientele can afford a Tesla. I can't afford a $120,000 Tesla, nor do I want a $120,000 Tesla. But I'm really struggling with the commercial small scale. I think at some point we're going to oversaturate a market to where I think, and this conversation's happened in the General Assembly already as far as what California and out west is doing to where you got $6 gas and so you've got a charging station that you pay for just like you go to the gas station. That is going to make its way. And that conversation wasn't a bill at the General Assembly, but it died because of just the whole use fee and everything else that I see where gas stations at some point are going to come in and it may not be tomorrow, it may not be two years from now, maybe five years from now, maybe 10 years from now, but I think they're, they're gonna take over that gray area. So that, that's my general comments, I have some more, but I'm really struggling with that percentage. But I do appreciate the time and energy y'all have put into it, I really do. Cameron, I'm gonna, I understand where you're coming from. I think one of the things that I, I don't, fully digest um, is, is is what we see charging, saying that you only see three. I, I served a lot of years on the Wave Transit Board and how many times I heard, I only see two people riding the bus, why do you need the big bus? Um, that, that, I don't think that's a, really a, a fair argument on what, what you see. Um, same could be said with gas stations, you don't, they're, they're empty a lot of times, um, but um, I, I understand, I, I think a discussion on the percentage and, and the discussion on the cap is warranted that um, staff has done a lot of work and, and I think this has really come from the administration to, to try to, to put something out there knowing that it's going to absolutely change in a, in a couple of years and this, this document will have to change um, and, and hopefully the market responds and this goes away. Um, I think that would be kind of the ideal where th it's so prevalent that, that this, this requirement can, can, can fall away. Um, but I do think we need to it, it give staff, and, and again, they've, they've already come to us once. We gave a little bit of feedback. Um, I think we need to really give them real feedback and, and real direction if this is something um, we're wanting them to, to research further rather than just toss around some ideas and, 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 and let it die. So th that's my only thoughts on this. Mr. Uh, yeah, as, as a similar comment to yours. Um, uh, I use the example, Mr. Moore, of, um, you know, uh, twice a week when I go into the restroom at our office building, the paper towel dispenser's empty. I don't know how it got empty, and, but I never see anybody in there. I, 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 I agree that I, I, I really dislike the idea, well, I drive by there and only see two or three cars. You don't know. There may never be a car there. But, you, but to just say, yeah, I go by there, I don't think that's, we need data related to that 
facility to be able to make a, a clear and reasonable decision. I, for one, uh, am, am, am very happy to see uh, staff and, and the county uh, trying to get ahead of the problem when all we do is react to problems. This is an opportunity to get ahead of it. It will change. And eventually, the market, the market will drive this. But right now, the market isn't. The market didn't drive handicap accessible parking spaces. We had to, we had to codify those in the building code to, to allow that to be a business. The, it is the same. It is the same. You had to push that. I believe it is the same. Um, but in general, I, I believe we need to get directions to staff on this. If there, if there's a modification to the percentage or a cap, as suggested, um, using handicap accessibility, there, there's, a, there's basically a cap on the number of accessible toilet fixtures. Once you reach a certain number of toilet fixtures, you're pretty much capped at five. I'm not saying that's what we should do, but I think that's not an unreasonable assumption that if you have a 600 uh, space parking lot that you shouldn't have to provide, uh, what's that, uh, 300? No, 120, 120 spaces. So uh, accessible or uh, EV stations. So uh, I believe we're moving in the right path. I believe this is um, necessary, and I would like for us to give real direction. So I just want to make sure my comments aren't taken out of context here, Mr. Hill. I made my views apparent, but one thing I did say is that philosophically I understand where staff is going, and I agree with that. My comments were based on the fact that the 10% or the 20% is way too much in certain applications. So don't take the comments out of context that I don't, we don't have the data for this or that. I understand that, but I'm telling you what I am seeing out there in the real world. There are things in this ordinance, this ordinance is not, in my opinion, quite there. Um, multifamily, I understand that. I think that's a different conversation, a wholehearted different conversation than just a small Smithfield. But we're talking only conduit, and I know it can be argued that it's cheap, it's not that expensive to put in, and all that stuff. And I've got the cost here from a civil um, company that puts it in every day. The challenge that I have is that I think the market is already doing their part, and I do agree that in two years we'll probably be back here. So I would rather do less than go more and have to take away and maybe build upon this. The other thing that this doesn't do, and I don't think, I think it needs to address it, is that are these parking spaces, the intent is not to be in addition to. That's the intent. That's my understanding. It's not in addition to, but it doesn't say. I think it needs to say that. Because you now have got ADA parking spaces that are required for the regular parking lot. Take EV out of the whole entire conversation. Now we're talking about we have to have a handicapped spot for these EV parking spaces. These parking spaces are going to be dual use because if I just run the conduit up and I don't have a charging station there yet, technically I can park my Ford F-150 gas guzzler right there. And so I just want to make sure that they're used as dual use until we see the market come in to have a better approach to it. That's my point. I, philosophically, I understand what we're trying to do and I applaud the county for trying to get out ahead of it because I see what the gas prices in California and everything else out is there. So I get it. But I'm just not there with this percentage. I do like a cap idea, that, that, but this for me right now, I'm just, I'm a no. Mr. Hahn. So I appreciate the hard work that the staff has put in on this. And I'm very excited to see that we are at least looking at this issue. Um, I think it's extremely important. I, I'm on the side of, you know, let's be part of a community that's forward looking and not looking backwards. And the easy thing to do is nothing. That is the absolute easiest thing to do. There's not a lot of leadership in saying, oh, let's just stay with the status quo. So, like Cameron, I, philosophically, I'm I'm a hundred percent on board with this. Philosophically, the devil is in the details, and there's a lot of details that none of us truly know because we don't have crystal balls. Because this is an evolving um, technology. Um, 
in, you know, is one person on this board. The low-hanging fruit is the multifamily, and in my opinion, office. And then you have everything else, and all of a sudden do we end up casting such a broad net that we're making really bad requirements on things that don't make sense. Personally, I don't get it to have a charging station at a Smithfield's barbecue. I, that doesn't make sense to me. I, I would not have made that business decision um, if I was operating at Smithfield's barbecue. Um, but it, I, I think uh, Mr. Avery in our agenda session you know, made a very clear point that you know, most of the charging is going to be occurring at home. So we've approved all these apartment buildings, and whether it's when they're built or 10 years from now, they, there is going to be a requirement, a, a demand of that clientele for charging. And I think we should be incorporating that, both, again, multifamily and office. As far as percentages, I don't I don't know. I mean, a cap makes sense, makes total sense. Um, it, um, it, it, I, it, it, in the conduit, I mean, Cameron, to your point, it really is cheap. I mean, w these are not onerous requirements until you get to the large parking lot, the, you know, 120 spaces. Make, it just, that doesn't make common sense to me. Um, and that would probably be pretty onerous um, on, on the developer. So, um, I mean, is, I, I don't know the procedural process on this, but it, you know, I don't want to table this, but I'm not prepared to vote for it as is, but I'd, I'd love to see a, a little more work well, be done without us taking a year to, to get there. <laughs> no, I, and, and I think we could, we could potentially do a continuance if, I don't know if time is an absolute critical piece on this. If, if we can direct staff to dig into some items. Um, I would say time's not an issue. Right. At this point in time. Okay. Um, I, I, I do think we need to keep this open and, and at least dig into the work that's been done and, and give the staff some direction. And Mr. Moore brings up some good points. Um, the conduit change, size changing, the, the things, the practicalities, and the devil is in the details. Um, so I, I really entertain some more discussion if, if we want to direct staff to looking at um, a, a potential cap and differentiating between um, a residential use and, and a non-residential or a, I guess a, just a commercial use. Um, and, and I guess the, um, the circuit issue that was discussed. Um, I, yes. I, I, I meant to say something too about, I, I didn't see where it said circuit breaker. It said, I, I saw circuit, 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 not circuit breaker. Dedicated circuit. Circuit, breaker. but not circuit breaker. That's not different. Okay. Do, do you have, with hearing that, does that change that, up your opinion? Or? No, no. Okay. I, I, I think that, I, I think rather than calling it um, 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 a limit, maybe a, a maximum required, or something like that. Um, sure. And and one question for: um, Did we, in your finding, I think I asked you this at our agenda briefing. Um, mm -hmm. Other municipalities that you investigated really didn't break out the uses. Is that what you? On, the only one that I found that really broke it out was the city of Apex, Apex. and they have like office, light industrial, some, and I, I can pull it. So it was you. limited. It wasn't a hundred different uses. It was very Correct. limited and. Yes, sir. I think it was about 15 different uses. Um, but mul the, the biggest difference between theirs and ours is they do have um, multifamily at 30% and some of the others were at 15. Okay. And, and, and that may be a right number for, for multifamily. Um, I, I think, I think, that that's an, an item that needs to be vetted um, a little bit more. It, uh, yeah, yes, Mr. I just want to make one point on the multifamily. Yeah. Yes, residential. And I know this is just overarching thing. We're sitting here talking about putting regulation on ourselves, essentially, as 
the construction industry and the development industry, but yet we'll come back next month and we'll talk about affordable housing. I just put that in context that as we're going through this and percentages and breakpoints and stuff like that, let's keep that in the back of our mind because yes, it's cheap to put until you put 120 or 60. At 200 parking spaces on a multifamily, you're at 60 EAV ready parking spaces. And that is a cost. And that's gonna to go to the consumer. And it's gonna go into the rent. So we're, I just wanna make sure we are talking one-sided and not both out of both sides of our mouth. And I'm done tonight. Mr. Hine. I would like to introduce uh, uh, to this meeting from the comment that we had from, uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name, the engineer from Paramount. Uh, the concept of, of, uh, of um, incentivizing actual installation of charging stations, do we w want, has staff even thought of that? Has there been any direction? I, I would ask Mr. Dickerson. Not at this point, no sir. Um, we, we were just looking at getting a baseline on the books that we could work with. Understood, sure. All right. I mean, yeah, I mean, no, I think that's a fair, you know, fair discussion. Give me a little density, well. I'll put in your charging station. I mean, that's <laughs> Mr. Tarrant, you, had, you wanted to say. Yeah, I've, uh, one of the things I thought was, you know, important to keep in mind, it's already brought up, was I, I do think that we need to be cognizant of not going too far too fast and i'm not saying that this is too far too fast necessarily but it does feel like um like as a society we're not quite here yet and i do think that we need to be proactive and we need to get ahead of it i do think that we're getting there but i think baby steps is important um the breaking out of the different uses i think is very important i think it's, a, it's completely different from one to the other as far as really, I think, the, uh, the amount of spaces that would need to be required for those, especially where we are right now, with the idea that as we progress as a, as a society and the demand becomes more, we can always add more. And I understand that you know, we're trying to get ahead of, the thing, of this, but that, to me, strikes a little bit of a balance because I can tell you I do struggle with the fact that we are attempting to implement this as a requirement um, instead of letting the market react. And so to me, there's a balance there by saying, we understand that we're moving forward and we wanna get ahead of it, we wanna be proactive, but we're not gonna require too much from you. Um, we see in these particular areas that there is a demand for it. We wanna respond to that. And then in these other areas, it's soft and we're not going to require you to do something that's not there yet, we will deal with that later. Because <clears throat> the market is gonna pivot. There used to not be a gas station on every corner. I mean, there used to not be. And now there is, why? Because everybody's got two cars, <laughs> you know? I mean, I just wanna, I, I do think we just need some restraint, some baby steps, Acknowledging it, getting in front of it, being proactive, absolutely, but not going too far where we're asking too much too soon. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying, you know, it's a chicken or the egg thing, right? You know, the powers that be would like us to drive more electric cars. And one of the things that they believe is keeping us from driving more electric cars is accessibility of charging and different things and making it more convenient for us. So if we put those in and we make those available, will we buy more electric cars? I, again, I'm not gonna get into that discussion, but we're kind of a cog in that, right? So I think we need to be careful of how far into that we go until we kind of see where we're headed. All right, any other comments or thoughts? Mr. Matthew. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I believe Mr. Moore brought up some very good comments, some things that I hadn't thought about uh, quite as deeply before now, but um, clearly people will charge their vehicles more at home, whether it's a single family home, multifamily. Right now they charge them at home more. 
rather than say 20% across the board, let's, let's bifurcate this thing. Let's maybe maybe the answer is 30% of the space is at a, um, in a multifamily place rather rather than 20. Maybe the answer is 15 or thereabouts in in commercial. Um, Toyota is working on a EV battery that will charge for well over 500 miles. So as as that technology is adopted, there's going to be less need for people to charge at the office or at the, the at the, the mall or, or wherever they are during the daytime. They'll they'll continue to do more charging at night. What you said about the convenience stores, you're right. I mean, as as people are buying less gas. Convenience stores are going to want to replace that revenue. They're going to want to do something to get you off the road and into their store. If it's EV, if it's a dancing bear, if it's whatever, they're, they're going to do something to get you off the road. And, and a lot of people are going to be recharging at convenience stores. I saw one within the last 90 days where there are three gas canopies outside of the, the store. One was completely being retooled had where six pumps were, they, they're going back with six EVs. So that, that is a trend. Um, this being said, I, th I think it would be a good idea to look at putting a higher percentage in, in multifamily and maybe a lesser percentage in, in commercial. All right. Um, any further discussion or anyone? Um, I don't think it really applies asking you if you want to table or. <coughs> that, that doesn't, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. I'd like to make a comment, please. Yes, um, sir. I can't wrap my head around the metrics of all this right here. Okay. I, I don't understand how we will put ratios of need for EV stations based on the number of electric vehicles that might be in this country in next year, in 10 years, or 20 years. Um, I do support some ideas that if you're going to put a station in, there'd be some, some zoning restrictions about setback and things like that, but treat it like a utility. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I just, I don't think we're behind anything on this. I, and we're not trying to get ahead because we're not behind at this point in time. And I think the market ought to be the driving force completely in this matter. And I, I, I'll work with... I appreciate what they've done. They did a lot of hard work on this, very good, and I appreciate that. But um, and I'll participate in crafting regulations that address the setbacks or whatever zoning restrictions we have for for the post itself or for the poles. No, because all it is is the poles. When I we call it charging stations, like it's some big monstrosity. You know, it's about just bigger around. You know, it's not it's not very big. The market's going to take care of it. I guarantee it. That's my opinion anyway. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion or a, a motion for a, a continuant? A continuance? Yeah. Here. Yes, please. Pete brings up a valid point, you know, and I would look to the design professionals here, obviously, from you and Clark. We go to page, well, it's not page numbers, but electric vehicle space design requirements. That section right there, I think, is fairly close to being good. It, it, um, it's fairly close to? To being good. Good. I mean, I mean, maybe some minor little tweaks here and there. I do like having something here as far as dual purpose parking. I don't think it would be in here. So, I mean, I think as far as direction to staff to kind of give them, because I don't want to see them go around and around and around here. That's not fair to them. Right. And it's certainly not fair to us in our time at the commissioners. So I think that section, I didn't really hone in on a lot of problems there. So I'm, I, and I think to Pete's point, those are standards. Those are things that are in place for safety, health, and welfare. So from a design professional, I'm going to kind of look at you guys. You know, I didn't hear y'all screaming bloody murder on those sections. Y'all, it seems like we're we're coming in on the percentages where we're coming in at. I like the idea of kind of coming to more a tailor approach. Um, you know, the city of Wilmington, for example, um, I think are they around five percent or something? They're a low percentage. They're at four percent, but, but they, they also, also require they you to put the they, they yeah. require get, you to put in. That. We're not doing that. Right. Okay. <laughs> I get that. I understand that. But I'm just saying, as far as reference, mm -hmm. 
I do like the idea of, and hopefully there, I think I've, I'm hearing some synergy within the board here to say, okay, let's break out maybe from a use specific area. So on small scale, small scale commercial, it may not even apply. We get to a Home Depot, a big box, maybe it applies. We get to a multifamily, it applies. Is single family, single family, I guess, is exempt from this, but is the open space in single family exempt from this? I mean, technically right now it wouldn't be. If I've got a common area with a pool and all that area around there, it's got 25 parking spaces. I read this that I may or may not have to put those in. So I may be being a little selfish there, but I mean, so I just, some of those things I think need to have some little bit more dialogue. No, I, I, I completely agree. And I, I think that is, some, some I think that's the direction we were kind of all leaning towards and, and, and hinting at. So I appreciate your, your wording of that. Any other discussion or a, a motion? Mr. Hip? Uh, is there is there a need for a motion? Are we tabling this, or do we uh, a motion to table? Or I believe it would be a motion to continue to your next meeting. So I can move uh, that we request that this be continued to our next meeting. All right. We're I will not be at the next meeting, I must say, George. Is there an appetite to move this to a December meeting? And I guess I'm asking staff and the board. If it's possible, well, I'm trying to, to think through kind of just the logistics. We don't always know what we're going to get in advance. We that. know what we have on the plate for November. We know who's assigned those cases. So we have an idea of how much work can be done by the case planner, and so that would be, that would be on, on our end. Um, if it's the pleasure of the board, if not everybody is going to be here at next meeting, then, I mean, that would be that would be your decision. Well, I would say if a planning board member couldn't be here, they submit written comments. I, I, I would agree. Chairman. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I, personally, I, I think this was one of the first meetings. This came up at the first meeting that I, first or second meeting that I was here, and I was very excited about it. And we tabled it at that. If you remember, it was part of a, an overall uh, up, update, and it was pulled out at that time. And that disappointed me because I thought we were moving forward in a very positive way. So I, the sooner we can get this resolved, in my mind, I, I, I think it's better. So we have a, a motion, or Mr. Yes, I'd, I'd just like to ask a question of staff. Uh, you've, you've got a seven-headed monster up here. Uh, we're giving you enough clarity of where we're thinking. <laughs> that was gonna be my question, if it's appropriate for me to clarify with the board exactly what areas you'd like us to focus on. Sure. So far I have breaking out the uses and looking more into maybe what's appropriate for a small-scale commercial or a multifamily. Um, taking a look at Apex as a comp, I think they did a good job um, with theirs. I don't know how it works in real life um, with them. And also looking into a potential cap and maybe finding some comparable um, size metropolitan areas that have done a cap. I wasn't able to find one now, but that doesn't mean there's not one out there. Okay, and just for, for my personal thought, if you could consider maybe a higher percentage for multifamily, maybe a little bit lesser on, on the, the, the retail, the restaurants, or, or, or things of that nature uh, may be appropriate. Um, and, and, and I'll say, I, I made a note of two clarifications as well. One related to um, that this is not a requirement in addition to other required parking. Good. And then also um, clarifying to some extent um, things about amenity areas, or the percentage that's applied to expansions. Mm -hmm. And that was actually from a previous discussion, but I think that's a valid point of an area of clarification. And, and I would also add, if, if there is a, an ability to incentivize, really put this on the other end, where we're not um, making it a requirement, but having an, an incentive by doing this um, somehow, 
In, okay. in all due respect, I think that's the county commissioner's purview. That's not really our purview. We can we can recommend it that they consider it, but they're the ones that would. Uh, no, no, I mean we incentivize all, all things all the time. Um, so I, I okay. think it's I think it would be okay appropriate. Yes, land use and setting. Land use. Oh, yes. okay. I was thinking financial. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. We certainly can't do that. I don't think we can spend Sorry. the county's here. money. He's been here a year. <laughs> <laughs> a whole year. Um, if, if there's any feasibility to that, I, I would okay. appreciate are, that too. Are there any suggestions specifically for what you'd like to see in that way? Uh, Is there a way to maybe reduce some parking? We do have a provision that allows um, parking studies to be used to reduce right. the amount of parking. So I think that is something we could potentially work with. And that would be maybe for new stuff. And I guess you could use it in retrofit, but is there some opportunities? I think Kevin mentioned it um, from Mr. Schuler from Paramount Engineering, looking at some retrofits, if it's a retrofit and you've got some buffer area or you've got some landscaping islands or something like that to be able to have some flexibility. And I would have it maybe the language to where staff has that administrative flexibility. I think that's gonna help y'all. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we would probably take a look at and looking at incentives is um, making sure that we are not privileging this particular public policy desire over others and what are the most appropriate ones to offer as an incentive? Would it actually be an incentive? Or is it just something that makes it look like right. it, it, should, it should incentivize things? Um, so, so we'll take a look into it um, and, and we'll see what might be feasible. Um, and we'll, we'll bring it back to you and we'll include it in the staff report. So you know, even if you're not there in person, if you have um, perspective, then we would love to hear that. Great. Thank you very much. So we still have a, I think, a, Clark, you made a motion for a continuance. Is that correct? For a continuance to our next meeting. All right. We got a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. One, one opposed. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Thank you for your work on that. Um, next, we go to other items. Mr. Mr. Farrell. There was a. Did you have a presentation, Mr. Farrell? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. I didn't get. Sorry. And uh, I'm keeping it brief. We're on one page. So thank you, members of the board. This is a presentation to outline draft amendments uh, to the Unified Development Ordinance. Some of you may recall we've been regularly updating uh, and providing maintenance and housekeeping amendments since the completion of the UDO project in 2020 to ensure the ordinance stays up to date with current practice for development in the unincorporated county. Staff have identified two amendments to the ordinance. These are strictly, strictly technical to ensure the ordinance is current with the needs of DOT and the county's policy for landscape bonds. First is related to final plat certificates for private roads Currently, a certificate indicates a simplified process for converting a road from private to public for DOT adoption that is not in line with current DOT requirements. In conjunction with DOT, staff's proposed language is intended to be clearer for developers, DOT, and the public. Additionally, staff will be including an additional certificate currently required by county engineering related to impervious surface limits. The second is related to the ordinance requirements for landscaping bonds. Current and historic practice is that the Board of Commissioners delegated authority to county staff for the review and acceptance of those bonds. Uh, the intent is to better reflect staff's assigned role in that process. Following this presentation, the draft amendments will be released for public comment. That'll be tomorrow. 
Interested parties can find information on the Planning Department's development activity page in the link shown on the screen and can submit comments directly to staff. Uh, we'll close the public comment period on no October 20th at 5 p.m. and anticipate moving forward with a public hearing at the November 2nd Planning Board meeting. And I'm available for any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Farrell. Any questions? All right. Well, we appreciate no action on our part. I understand. No, sir. No action, but just uh, be on the lookout tomorrow when we send those out. I appreciate that very much. You're welcome. Any other items? Ms. Ryan. I have a couple of updates for you. Yes. Just um, first to let you know that we are anticipating presenting to the Board of Commissioners that they're meeting on October 16th um, the findings of our Western Bank study. Um, there will be recommendations included as part of that related to um, comprehensive plan amendments and zoning amendments as we referenced at the joint meeting um, back at the end of August. So that is something that you will be seeing more about in the coming weeks. I also wanted to make sure that you were aware, probably most of you um, have heard already, but um, Rachel Laco, who supervises our community planning team, which is both our long range planners and our housing program team, she has been um, hired as the um, new director of neighborhood housing and neighborhood services for the city of Wilmington. So she will be leaving us at the end of October, starting with the city beginning of November. So we're currently working to transition all of her work, which unfortunately includes a lot of the comprehensive plan as well as our housing work. So there may be some shifts to some of those timelines, but we will keep you informed as we work through those details. All right, thank you very much. One Mr. quick Hill. question, I'm sorry, I, I, I did not hear the date for the presentation of the West Bank uh, study. October 16th. Oh, okay. 16th. All right. That's a, that's a federal holiday, but so the county's October 16th is Columbus Day, I believe. It's Board of Commissioners meeting in, okay. in this room starting at 9 a.m. Yes. All right. Um, any other discussion? Um, motion for adjournment? Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>